Good news, good news. Always good news. Good news, good news. There is good news today. No matter what else is happening in the world. Always good news. Good news. There is always good news today. Good news, good news. Always good news. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. As always, want to tell you what's coming up on today's program. Our devotional time consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and uh, then our brief study of our passage. And today we're looking at what is truly the Lord's Prayer, recorded in John chapter 17. We're going to look at the first eight verses of this beautiful, powerful, and poignant prayer. John chapter 17. So open your Bibles to John 17 and get ready to read along and study along with us while I tell you what else is coming on this edition of Good News Today. Leroy Dedman with uh, Leaving a Legacy as he talks about playing second fiddle and brings some interesting points out about little known Bible names. You will not want to miss that. And then a little bit later on, it's the Challenges segment with Stephen Hall the challenge of achieving religious unity. And uh, incidentally, John chapter 17, uh, as you will see, deals later in this uh, same chapter as a part of this same prayer we're going to be studying part of today, deals with the, the basis upon which true unity can be achieved religiously. You will not want to miss uh, that segment with, with Stephen Hall. And then we have a question that basically deals with unity in a sense because uh, in our GNT Q&A our question today is does uh, John 15 1 through 8 do the branches in John 15 1 through 8 refer to denominations in other words can we have denominational division and still be pleasing to the Lord and does John 15 in fact refer to denominations we'll deal with that from the scripture. So we're so glad that you have joined us and we appreciate so much your interest in, in spiritual things. We're glad you've joined us here in the GNT newsroom. You know, it's been a while since I've mentioned that uh, our surroundings, and if you're a new viewer, you see that our surroundings tend to kind of take us back in time here in the, in the uh, GNT newsroom. But our determination spiritually is to take you back to the Bible, to the Word of God, and the Word of God alone. Let's go to that Word right now. As we read John chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust or sleep his frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground. i uh -huh. 
back for the study portion of our devotional time, and we hope you have your Bible still open to John 17. We're looking at a portion of what is truly the Lord's prayer in John 17. Uh, we're looking at the first eight verses of this prayer of Jesus not long before His betrayal and ultimate crucifixion. And part of what He prays in verse 4 um, deals with His glorification of of uh, the Father on earth, and then the plea in verse 5, to be glorified with the Father. And as Jesus says in this prayer, verse 4 is recorded, I have glorified you on the earth, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. It reminds us of the redemptive work of Christ that uh, the Father sent Christ to do and that Christ so willingly and lovingly was willing to do, uh, came to do, and ultimately it would culminate it will culminate in His crucifixion, but most importantly in the resurrection following His crucifixion. And as He prays to the Father, uh, that, that redemptive work is as good as done. And uh, He is determined that um, if this cup cannot be removed as He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, that He will go through with the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could possibly save you and me from our sins and how thankful we ought to be that He was willing to glorify the Father by finishing the work that the Father gave Him to do. And then His plea in verse 5 is, And now, O Father, glorify me together with Yourself with the glory which I had with You before the world was. And that, that plea reminds us of where Jesus was before He humbled Himself, gave up equality with God, as Paul writes in the Philippian letter at chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, where he admonishes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and then goes on to, to talk about what Jesus gave up, what He sacrificed in order to save you and to save me. And so he pleads here for uh, a restoration of that glorification that He had uh, with the Father. But then there's something very important in the remainder of our section that we're studying uh, uh, from this prayer that relates to the power of the Word. Because Jesus talks in this first uh, portion about Himself and, uh, and then He turns His attention to the apostles. Uh, verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me. He's talking about the apostles here. And uh, how did he manifest the name of God, the, the authority of God, the will of God? Verse 8, I have given to them the words which you have given me. I have given to them the words which you have given me. Me, In other words, the communication through the words. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. There's an emphasis throughout this prayer. And if you'll read the remainder of this, um, of this beautiful and powerful and poignant prayer of Christ to the Father, you will see throughout an emphasis on, on the word. For example, if we looked over at verse 17, he says, sanctify them. He's still talking about the apostles. Through your truth, your word is truth. Sanctify them through, through uh, your truth. What is truth? Your word is truth. And so it's, it's a reminder that the word that we now have in its final complete and written form is the word that will sanctify, set us apart from the world. It is the it word that will save us. It is the word that will guide us ultimately to heaven and we must all be united upon that word. As we mentioned earlier, Stephen Hall is going to talk more about that, that unity uh, a little bit later on. That's all the time we have for our devotional time. Right now it is time for Leroy Dedman and his excellent segment, Leaving a Legacy. Have you ever played second fiddle? The famous conductor Leonard Bernstein reportedly said the hardest instrument to play is second fiddle because everyone wants to play first chair. Now, I'm not a musician, but I have played second fiddle a few times. When I was operation manager for GBN, my phone rang one afternoon and I answered it, and the voice on the other end identified himself as the assistant preacher of one of the larger churches over in Middle Tennessee. And he said, Brother Dedman, we're having a summer series and the elders wanted to uh, have some of the best preachers in the brotherhood, and they suggested I call you. Well, of course, I was elated, and I reached from a calendar to, you know, see what dates had open, and as I did, he said, uh, 
Do you have James Watkins' phone number? <laughs> well, you know, that kind of brings you down off of cloud nine in a hurry, and it was an humbling experience, to say the least. But now, don't get me wrong. I count it a blessing to play second fiddle to a man like James Watkins, which I've done before. When he had heart surgery, I was privileged to hold a gospel meeting for which he was scheduled. I even played second fiddle to Brother Tom Holland, who double booked and was not able to fulfill all the days of a meeting. These are good men whom you might play second fiddle. However, second place does not get it with God. Jesus made that plate in Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God must be first place in our lives. Who remembers these names? Shamna, Shapha, Egel, Pathy, Gadel, Gadai, Amiel, Sether, Nabi, Gil. I don't know that I pronounced them all correctly. But don't feel badly if you don't remember who these men are, as you may be in the majority. Now, some of you may recognize them as the ten spies who brought back the report that we can't take the land of Canaan. Well, they're like giants, and we're like grasshoppers. We find this in Numbers chapter 13, and verse 33. Now, most all who have any knowledge of the Bible would recognize the names of Joshua and Caleb. They, of course, said, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. We can accomplish a lot when God is for us. Remember the words of the beloved Apostle Paul, who by inspiration gave these words in Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? When God is on our side, we come in first place every time. If you don't believe this, ask the shepherd boy who slew the giant Goliath, or Gideon, who took 300 men and defeated 135,000 Philistines. We can be assured God is on our side as he has provided us a means by which we may be saved from sin and inherit our eternal home with all the saved of all the ages. Christ died for us. He shed his own precious blood on the cruel cross of Calvary that we might have that eternal place he has prepared for us. For all this, he asked us that he not play second fiddle in our lives. An interesting and informative segment, as always, from Leroy Dedman, Leaving a Legacy. Coming up, our Challenges segment with uh, Stephen Hall. But before we get to that, we get to this, the information we want you to have uh, through which you may contact us because we do want to hear from you. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 15148, Chattanooga, Tennessee 37415. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 15148, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37415. Good news, good news. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1 877 384 7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. You know, earlier we uh, dealt with our devotional time scripture, John 17, 1 through 8, and, and uh, talked about um, the unity that is also a part of this prayer of Jesus in John 17. Well, right now Stephen Hall is going to bring us a very, very informative and very important segment on the challenge of achieving religious unity. And a little bit later on in, in John 17, as we mentioned, Jesus uttered these words, I do not pray for these alone. Remember the apostles about whom Jesus prayed in the second part of this prayer. Now he turns his attention to all who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, 
that the world may believe that you sent me. The challenge of achieving religious unity. Stephen Hall deals with that right now. Are you facing a challenge today that you find to be very difficult in overcoming? Well, certainly you're not alone. We all have challenges and we all face difficulties. But one great thing about the Christian is that the Christian has God to help him in every challenge. I can't imagine what it would be like to not be a Christian. Oh, of course, I used to be at one point in my life, so I guess I can think back to what it was like to not be a Christian. But the longer I am a Christian, the more appreciation that I have for God and for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and for the gift of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for His Word. I love God and I love the church. I love His Word. And I hope today that you also love God and you love His church and you love His Word. Because it is within that vacuum that we find the very help that we need to overcome these challenges in life. And so today as we turn to the Word of God, hopefully we can help in overcoming the challenge of maintaining unity. When we think about unity, unity is extremely important in the church. The devil desires nothing more than to divide and conquer. That is his desire. He wants to undo everything that God has done. And so he would like for the church to fight amongst themselves. He would like for the members to be at odds against one another and focus on those problems rather than focusing on saving souls. And that is why we need to make sure that we are maintaining unity in the Spirit, that we keep that bond of peace, as the Apostle Paul writes. And I hope you have your Bibles today. And if you do, please open them to the book of Ephesians. We're going to take a few lessons from this great book in understanding how we can maintain unity and overcome the challenge of disunity in the church. But notice first that in the very first chapter of Ephesians, that Paul sets forth our spiritual position as well as our spiritual possession in Jesus Christ. Begin reading with me, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through verse 7. When Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace." And so Paul sets forth in the very first chapter that we have been now made to sit in heavenly places with Christ. That's our position. And we have had our sins forgiven and all of the blessings from God are now bestowed upon us as His children. That is our possessions. But now Paul then, in the last few chapters of Ephesians, he deals primarily with the subject of unity and Christian duties. Remember that it was Jude who wrote in Jude 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was given once and for all time to the saints. Now that idea of given once unto the saints is the idea of like a child being born to a woman. When a woman gives birth to a child, she does so once and for all time. That child is not physically ever born again, but rather he is born once and for all time. And that, of course, is the same way that the faith has been given unto mankind. It was given once and for all time. Therefore, we need no Latter-day Revelation. We have all of the Scripture that we need right here in our hands. And so while Paul is, of course, addressing this issue, we must not forget the importance of unity because that is why Jesus Christ, when He died, He prayed in John chapter 17 before He was crucified for that unity. So a great work that Jesus performed on the cross was to bring those people who are in the church together in unity. And it is our job to maintain that unity. 
When we disrupt unity or when we do things that cause problems or create disunity in the church, we are going directly against the prayer that Jesus prayed. And so therefore, I would like for us now to focus on the attitudes that are needed to maintain unity. Look with me, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through verse 3. Notice again that Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which ye were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice the attitudes that Paul says that we must have. We must be lowly, we must be meek, and we must forbear one another in love. But there is also the basis of unity, and we find those in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through verse 6. Notice again that Paul writes that there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Well, that word that Paul uses here in verse 4, that there is one body, is also the same word that he uses in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, when he writes about the church. So we see that because there is one church, one body, and likewise because there is one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and likewise we have one hope in our calling, one Lord Jesus, one faith, the system of faith, one baptism for the remission of sins, that is an immersion in water, one God, that is to say our Father, and He is above all and through all and in you all. So we see that there are certain attitudes that we must have, but likewise there is the basis for unity. But now I would like to share with you what Paul says is the recipe for unity. Go with me now in Ephesians chapter 4 and let's begin reading, if you will, in verse 29. When Paul writes, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now notice this. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now those are the things that we are to put away. We are to put away any kind of bitterness, any kind of wrath, any sort of, of anger or malice that we have toward one another. For you see, when we don't put these things away, they build. And they, of course, will cause disunity. So what is now the recipe to maintain unity? Well, we put away these things, but there's a little more that we must also do. Notice he said, and after we put away these things, that we are to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So the next time that you are tempted to have the, the problem of dealing with disunity in the church, remember that Jesus Christ, if you have obeyed the gospel of Christ, has forgiven you. That is the same attitude we must have for others. And it is God's desire, it is His will and His command that we all remain unified in the faith. I remember the old comic strip by Charles Schultz. You may remember it called Peanuts. Well, you may remember that Lucy, of course, came in one day to Lioness, and she told Lioness to change the television show. And he asked her, for what reason would I do so? And she held up her hands like this. And he said, why, because of your fingers? And she said, no. You see, when I put all my fingers together, they become a formidable force. And that is why you need to change the channel. Well, then Lioness walks out and he looks at his fingers and he says, why can't you get together like that? Well, brethren, the church needs to stay unified. We need to be one in Christ. Well, the only basis for unity is the basis that the Lord gave us. And as God the Father and God the Son are one, we must be one in that same way. They are one in doctrine. So must we be one. In doctrine. Our thanks to Stephen Hall for the excellent challenges segment. Coming up, our final segment. That's our GNT QA, and today's question Do the branches in John 15, 1 through 8, refer to denominations? We'll deal with that from the scripture, as always, after we take another brief information break. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. 
We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 15148, Chattanooga, Tennessee 37415. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 15148, Chattanooga, Tennessee 37415. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. We're back for our final segment. It's our GNT Q&A. And the question, as we mentioned earlier, do the branches in John 15, 1 through 8, uh, represent uh, the denominations? Well, the answer is no. They represent individual members of the body of Christ, uh, individual disciples. And the context makes that uh, abundantly clear. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. And then he mentions, every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He goes on, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you, uh, speaking to the apostles, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He's talking about individuals. Then he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now listen, he who abides in me, not the denomination that abides in me, but he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Then listen again to verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. It becomes very clear that Jesus is speaking of individual disciples and how important it is that they remain in Him, abiding in Him. The equivalent of abiding in Christ is to abide in His teaching. Therefore, as we've been talking about earlier in the program, we cannot achieve religious unity by being divided into various religious groups with various religious names, differing names and differing doctrines. But we must be one in Christ Jesus. No, the branches are individuals, not denominations. Thanks for being with us for another edition of Good News Today. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, good news the world. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world. Good news, good news, good news, good news.